mean, median mode, uh, mid range, range, standard deviations, all that stuff. These are things that could be done on a graphing calculator. It's a, uh, a question of whether you're using Desmos or the TI calculator. Uh, I'll show you on both, and, and that's the approach that we'll take. Uh, the idea, again, being that the Desmos calculator is wonderful for learning and you know the day-to-day -day operations within the class, but the TI calculator is what they allow on the exam. All right, so we have to always be mindful of that. All right, but if I needed to find the mean of a data set, there's a few different ways to do it. Uh, like I said, I'll start with Desmos. Uh, the first way is the obvious way, and that is just add them up and divide by the number of values in the set. All right, so you know you just do something like this, and then using rote computation, where there are six values, you'd pop it all into a calculator. So in Desmos, and if you don't already have a Desmos account, I, I guess I could walk you through that super quick. Uh, let me just do that before I forget. Uh, Google. Yeah, so you would go to desmos.com and tap on sign up. All right. Uh, I, I link it to an external account. It's up to you whether you want to do that or if you want to you know, create a, an account from scratch. Uh, if you do it with external, check the two boxes and then select the one that you're going to use uh, the credentials from. So Google or Apple or whatever. So if you go to Google, it'll ask you to sign in. But once you sign in, you are active in Desmos. You have an account and you're ready to rock and roll. All right, the benefit of doing that is when you complete your work, you can save it obviously, but also you can hit that little share icon and that'll allow you to create a share link to your Desmos, which is sufficient from, from my standpoint for, um, for work on an assessment, all right? So if you wanna show your work by submitting a Desmos link, uh, that, that sounds great. Right, uh, Desmos does a lot of things that it, it's going to save us time and energy. Like, for example, making a making a graph. Right, y yeah, you can make a graph by hand, but it's a whole lot nicer to have a technologically produced graph that you could submit. Right, and even if you don't want to actually submit a share link, you can do a screenshot, put it in a Word document, type up your responses that way. You know. So, but if you wanted to crunch some numbers, it's, it's a fully functional calculator. It's division, since there's multiple terms, it's better to put the division bar in first. Otherwise, uh, it's only gonna, Desmos is gonna think you're trying to divide only one number by the six. So I would type in the 15.1 with my fat fingers and miss some values along the way, but I'm sure it'll all work itself out in the end plus 3.2 plus six, and then pop it over a six, and you get that value at the bottom, or, or that computed value uh, below, all right? On the left side of the screen, in the, in the little blue rectangle, you see a fraction icon, all right? That means that a fractional answer is available, all right? All you have to do is tap on it, and it'll put it into fraction form for you. All right, for the sake of finding means and stuff like that, maybe that's not the best thing to do. So in this case, we would just round it. We round to three significant digits. All right, so that's the first three values, the first three non-zero values after a decimal point. All right, in most cases, that's just gonna be three decimal places. So in this case, 12.367. But for example, if you had something like 0 .0001049, this would round to, thanks people, rounds to 0 .000105. All right, because after the string of zeros end, that's when you start counting one, two, three places. All right, so that's what I mean by significant digits, not sig figs, all right? I, I don't even think I remember how to do sig figs, but that, that's not what we're looking for here. 
Uh, as a general rule of thumb, if rounding instructions aren't given, you should always round to at least one more decimal place than the data set. All right, so here the data points are rounded to the nearest tenth. So when you round your answer, you should go to at least the nearest hundredth. Go to the nearest thousandth to be safer. The, the more digits you include, the safer you are. All right, because in statistics, you start to get a, a sense of what constitutes an unacceptable amount of error. Whereas if you're, if you're in a, like a pre-calc class and you're, you're doing like law of signs and law of cosines, you know, you get an answer of like 15.1 meters. You know, what's, what really is the difference between 15.1 and 15.09? You know, minimal in terms, it's a linear measure. But if you're talking about an angular result, there is a massive long-term difference between something like 60 degrees and 60.1 degrees. All right. It could lead to, I mean, if you just think about an angle, in the short term, a slight variation in the angle might lead to only a slight variation in the opposite length. But if you were to project that out hundreds of miles, that's going to lead to a massive difference in the, the length of the opposite side. All right. So under certain circumstances, rounding is very important. And in other circumstances, we, uh, we can kind of take liberties. We need to make a decision on, or at least know when to make a decision on when it's important. Uh, now, this does not really show us the true power of Desmos. What will is if you go into, you tap into the, or click into the open field, you see the calculator appears, you could tap on functions, and you see a lot of different options there, all right? One of those options is stats. We're going to live out of stats and distribution pretty much for the whole year. I mean, we will do some stuff in miscellaneous and very little bit in trig, but you know, the, the basic unit circle trig is really all you need for this class. You know, nothing too, uh, nothing too fancy. But you see one of the options here is mean. Now you might look at this and say, how is this any better than just typing it in manually? All right, so let me just show you some nifty tricks when it comes to Desmos. First, I'll save this there. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna type in, by hitting that plus symbol, I'm gonna type in the data into a, into a table. All right, so plus and then select a table. All right, I'll put my data points in the X1, but I can call it whatever I want. All right, if you don't wanna call it X1, you could call it just an X, you can call it A, like whatever you want, all right? As long as it's a symbolic string, all right? So if you put something like AB, Desmos might think you're looking for a product between column A and column B and it'll get confused. You could just leave it as a default also, all right? So 15.1, 17.5, 18.3, and so on. All right, so I have my data in. What I can do is I could tap into that field, that, that blank field that's always gonna be available below the previous computation, and go to functions, mean. When, when you're computing the mean, you could type in all the values if you want, separated by commas, but I would, I would again say, how is that any better than just finding the, the sum and dividing by six? What you should do instead is type in the column heading X1, it'll spit out the mean. Now, I didn't do anything special to bring up the subscript of one. For whatever reason, Desmos knows that if you put a number after a letter, that you're probably looking to make it a subscript, so it defaults to that, all right? So you look at this and you say, well, what is the benefit of doing it this way? Now, if I needed to include or, or remove a value from my table, let's say I put in a 10, it'll modify the mean without me having to reintroduce that command, all right? So, or I can remove values. Now, this doesn't seem like it'll be important, but when we talk about outliers, outliers are data points that shouldn't be in a data set for whatever reason, either because there was a mistake. You know, you meant to write one and a zero, but forgot to hit the space bar, so you ended up with a 10 in there, you know, like a human error but it could also be something that's so extraordinarily different as to question the reason why it's there to begin with. So for example, if I'm polling 
uh, the ages of students in a class, in a high school class. All right, you get 16, 17, 18, 19, whatever. But if there's a 75 there, it's like, why is that 75 there? All right, so is that an outlier? Should it be there? Is there actually a 75 year old student in the, in the class? Probably not. All right, so what should it have been? Well, maybe the person accidentally hit a one, uh, a seven instead of a one, wrote 75 when it should have been 15. You know, like sloppy, sloppy penmanship threw somebody for a loop. If they don't know the context, they might say, oh, that 75 makes perfect sense, but in reality, it doesn't. All right, so you have that as a means to find the mean. All right, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't even bother with this one. I just wipe all that out. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce a note that this is finding the mean. I mean, it's kind of common sense because the command actually has the term mean in it, but not always, you know. So there, there will be some functions that don't look like the name, you know. Like, so if I'm if I'm looking for the uh, the z score for something we'll, we'll talk about that down the line i'm actually going to use a function called inverse so you you would want to give it a little heading so you tap on the plus sign followed by note the next thing would be the median so if i wanted to find the median of a data set functions tap on stats you see that there's an option for median x1 type it in and it'll give you the median of that data set so now I don't, I'm getting into the habit of not having to type in the same data set repeatedly. I'm just applying different commands to it, all right? So you go through the, the list here, you see a lot of different vari uh, varieties, geez, uh, a lot of different options. Um, total, length, mean, all that stuff. You won't find a mode, right? Uh, I, I honestly don't know why. I think maybe the, the programming is a little too too tricky for Desmos. I, I don't know, but mo identifying a most common frequent or, or most frequent value in a data set, programming wise is, is a little on the tricky side because what it is is it, it requires each data point to be compared in value to each other data point and the most number of equalities would dictate the, the actual mode. All right, so they don't have a mode function in here but maybe we can get away with it in some other capacity, all right? So let's see if the, uh, first off, I'm gonna type in a note saying that this is the, the method for finding the mode. I'm gonna type in the word histogram, all right? Very important. Uh, in Desmos, when you start typing what you think the title of a command is, you'll know if you're right or not based off of whether it stays italics or it goes to ordinary font. So in this case, let's see, I start typing in histogram, hist, you know, it's, it's italics. It doesn't know what I want to do. It, it's asking if I want to create sliders. It's basically saying, all right, are these three sep or four separate variables? If so, what would you like the value of H, I, S, S and T to be, all right? But if you keep typing histogram, it locks it into the ordinary font saying, okay, we recognize this as a command. Histogram of what? X1, it asks you for a few things like the bin width, how you wanna represent the bar height, All right? You could, if you're unsure of something, you just tap on a little question mark and it'll bring up a little, uh, little cheat sheet for you, but if you're going by bin width of one, you see it, it, it put a little comma one right after the X one. If I wanna make it go by more than just one unit, I might hit something like five and let it group the data by fives, right? So it would go from whatever the lowest value is, let's say zero, zero to, uh, zero to four, then five to nine, then so on, all right? So you could do it that way, but I actually want it to be at a bin width of one Right, because, well, actually, it's not a good example because I'm still working off of that first data set. But if you're dealing with integer values or whole number values, if you set your bin width to one, then it'll identify 
the number of times each individual value occurs. All right, so I'll show you what that looks like in a second. It actually turns out in this case, because the, the, the decimals are rounded to the nearest tenth, that you should let, it, let the bin width be 0.1, and it'll tell you how often each item occurs. Uh, bin width, uh, just, just to make sure I get the vocabulary across, all that's saying is how wide you want the bar to be. All right, do you want it to go by you know, zero to one, then one to two, and so on? Or do you want it to go by tens or twenties or whatever? What, what are you going by? All right, so in this case, if I wanted to, I could, I could go this route and just look for the bar with the tallest, or look for the tallest bar, all right? They're all of the same height. So what that would tell me is that there is no mode. So even though these questions, the first example didn't ask for it, we could say from the calculator, from the Desmos calculator, that the median is 14.6 and that there's no mode. All right, there's no value that occurs any more frequently than any other value, all right? But I would go back and change that to a one. Now, maybe you don't wanna tap in and out of a histogram command, one thing that you could try to do, it doesn't always work, but you could put in a dummy variable. Some commands just don't, don't allow you to put in a dummy variable. But if you do that, like the letter A, it'll present you with a, with a slider option. And so I can manipulate the bin width by sliding along the slider because that's gonna change the value of A that's contained within the histogram. But the negatives won't make any sense. So if you tap on the lower bound of the slider, make that whatever you want the lowest value to be, in this case, zero, and then something like, I don't know, 10, just as sort of a default, then you can create a slider that has a variety of bin widths or that represents a variety of bin widths and then decide on how you want your histogram to look before committing to what, whatever the bin width is gonna be, all right? so. In, uh, in statistics, it, it, we, we tend to focus on ways to mislead people, but more so, I mean, the, the proper way to say it is to focus on ways to not be misled by other people, but it's kind of like, how do you protect yourself from getting robbed? Learn how people rob other people, and then create the approach that you would use in order to avoid getting robbed. All right, this is the same idea where we're gonna learn how to deceive people in order to protect ourselves from being deceived, all right? And so one way that you can deceive is by manipulating the bin width on a graph to make the graph tell a story that you want it to tell, all right? The data may say one thing, but you can choose a bin width that, that perhaps will tell something else in terms of a story. So let's say I wanted my graph to look like that I now know that my bin width should be 3.3 .3 in order to make that happen, all right? But all that being said, that, you know, this is all wonderful. How does it tell us what the mode is? You, you, gotta, you gotta manipulate the data the proper way in order to be able to do that. So for example, if I'm looking at, I'll take D at the bottom here. Oh, turn my pen on. What I would do is I'd go into my data set, get rid of these values, so everything's gonna slowly disappear, replace it with the new data set, all right? My bin width should be one if I want it, so I could get my median 2.5, but I could get the mode just by adjusting my bin width to be equal to one, if it'll let me. And you look for the tallest bar, all right? The tallest bar corresponds with the most frequent item, all right? So if you know that the minimum is one and the maximum is four, you're just counting off the little tick marks on the graph all right, so we're looking at, oh, it's kind of hard to do it on the screen here, but one, two, three, four, the three occurs most frequently. You now have your mode, all right? Now you look at this and say, well, 
I would never do it that way because I can just look at the data straight away and determine that the mode is three. It's very easy to just pick it right out. It's a small data set though. All right? So you kind of think about it this way. Any data set that you would actually have to manually type in, you're probably not gonna use this technique because you just look at the data. Like if you physically have to type it in, it's probably easy enough to analyze visually. All right? This technique is great for when on a test or, or even in real life, I give you an Excel spreadsheet with 572 data points. And you say, now what? Well, you can copy from the Excel spreadsheet right into Desmos, but there's also ways to do it in, in Excel. So I'll show you those before too long also. All right. But that, that's one way you can figure out the mode without actually having to analyze the graph you know, just visually. All right, next up would be the mid-range. All right, so little note, mid-range. So what I'm gonna do here is before I get too far along, I'm gonna tap on this, I'm gonna hit save. It'll eventually save, it's thinking. But I'm gonna call this measures of center. And then I'm gonna create a share link post that up on Schoology so you have it, all right? That's part of the fun. Like, I don't, I don't like making things more than once if I can avoid it. So this is, this is something that I'll, I'll make available to you, all right? So measures of center. You know, internet's a little iffy right now, but it'll come through. It'll always come through. Okay, so I think it, it kind of saved. Anyway, so mid-range, you could go into your functions and, and look for that. You know, look for something that says mid-range. If it's there, that's great, but it won't always be there. The thing that you're looking for might not always be there. So what we can do is we can create it. We can create a script that'll allow us to compute the mid-range. So how do we do that? Well, the process for finding the mid-range is you average the highest and the lowest values. So there is no function in the calculator that says mid-range, but there is one that says max and there's one that says min. That sounds like it would be helpful. So under mid-range, I'm gonna create a division. I'm gonna put a two on the bottom because it's only gonna be two values that we're averaging. Function, max or min, it doesn't matter. Addition's commutative. Tell it where to find the data, x1. Then add to that maximum, tell it where to find the data, also X1. And now I have the mid range of this data set, All right? But I want the mid range of this data set. So what I'll do is I'll just go right on back to the beginning. And type in the fresh new data set. Oops. You notice how it auto-populated in 11? Desmos recognizes trends in data entry. So if it realizes that you're going by twos, it'll start putting, it'll start doing you favors. It'll start putting in a two for you. So I don't want that, act, uh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, it'll start adding by twos, all right? 17 is what I wanted for the last one. One, three, five, seven, nine, and 17. So then I could find the mean, I could find the median and all that stuff. But now I know the mid range Oops, mid-range is gonna be equal to nine. All right, so now I have a handy-dandy calculator that's gonna do that all, all that stuff for me, which is great, which is ideal, okay? So I'll save that in a little bit. But as far as the TI is concerned, just give you the quick, the quick version on that. Very straightforward, same idea you need to input data. The way to do that is to hit stat. You see option for edit. I have some data in, in here already, so let me get rid of that. So let's clear that out. So you go up to the column heading, hit clear, and either enter or down. Either way, it'll wipe out the entire column. You don't want to hit delete, all right? 
And then you just type in your data points. Uh, in this case, 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, and 17. All right, so I have my data locked in. Now I want the calculator to do all the work for me. The, good, the benefit of the TI, so second mode to quit out of any uh, menu that you're in, is that there's a lot of applications that'll do everything for you in one shot, all right? Calculator still won't give you the mode or the mid-range. You'll have to figure those out on your own, but it will give us the mean and the median, which are usually the more computation-heavy concepts anyway. So stat, calc, option one, one variable statistics, it'll ask you, if you have one of the newer ones, it'll present it in menu form, uh, it'll ask you where the data is. In this case, I have my list in L1. I don't have anything in L2, so let me just clear that out. There is, it's not a frequency table. We'll talk about those tomorrow. Then hit enter. It'll tell you the X bar, which is the mean, right? That's notation for the mean, X with a bar over it. Right uh, up to the left of the, the last entry, you see a down arrow. If you hit the down arrow, there's more information. You'll see median. You'll also see minimum and maximum, all right? If it's hard to identify minimum and maximum uh, beyond just doing it visually, then you could pull it out of here and just average those two numbers together to find the mid-range. For the mode, you would actually have to create a histogram on the calculator in order to come up with the mode, all right? It's a little bit more involved and I have a whole lesson on stack graphs uh, planned for you, so, uh, so we'll sit tight on that. But that, that's essentially all you would need to do in the TI calculator, all right? So, like I said, oh, get out of here. Like I said, I'm gonna save this Desmos, I'll post it up on Schoology for you. There's a link up there that says Desmos links, a link to Desmos links. It'll open a uh, Google sheet. One of the tabs is AP statistics, that's where I'll be saving everything, all right? So at this